Good morning, church. <clears throat> if you have your Bible or a copy of God's Word, let's go to Exodus 17, uh, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. It is good to be here with you this morning. I want you to know that I'm excited about the opportunity to be able to preach God's Word this morning, and I hope you're equally excited to receive God's Word this morning. Uh, it's one thing when you're cooking in the kitchen, you know, everybody's good at everything they do, right? You know, somebody told you growing up that everybody sounds good singing, you know? You've never heard a mama say, baby, that was terrible, you know? And, and, um, and then that becomes somebody else's problem down the road because your mama lied to you your whole life, amen? And, uh, and that's all right. You didn't expect that. You didn't see that coming, but things like that happen. But I'm going to tell you, it, it is good uh, to be in the house of the Lord this morning with God's people in God's presence, with God's promises. Uh, it's good to know that we can come here freely, uh, that we're not being judged this morning. It don't matter what you're wearing, we're just glad you're wearing something. Amen, somebody? Amen. Amen. That would certainly be a conversational piece, and we're so glad uh, that we're here this morning and that it don't matter who you are, don't matter where you've been, don't matter what you've done, that it, you are welcome in God's presence today and there is no question that God is in this place you know sometimes you might kind of wonder if he was a little busy but this morning he's blessing and he is in the house and I believe this morning uh, and you can back me up on this by an amen I think there's two or three that's gathered this morning in his name and because of that the Lord said well my my let me show up and let's have a good time together and so being able to sing his praises and, and spend some time in his presence. And you know what's so awesome is whatever it is you may be going through this morning, whatever's on your mind, weighs heavy in your heart, God can change. He can, he can bring you comfort today. He can rest your weary mind. He can, he can take our sins and wash them away and remember them no more. He, he can... He can put joy back in your life today. You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of joy suckers out there. Can I get a witness? Amen. They will suck the joy right out of you. But then the Lord said, let no man take your joy away. You know, so if they're getting our joy, it's because we're giving it to them. It ain't because they got the power to take it. And so today, we, we want to leave this place today smiling and profiling, a little pep in our step. Everybody's saved and washed in the blood. And if you've been saved and washed in the blood, this morning you may just need to be reminded of what happened on that day. Because we seem to forget where we come from, and we definitely sometimes forget where we're headed to. And, 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 and we can see that in God's Word today, where some of these people, um, and now people's people, we all have tendencies, and, and we all have the same struggles and things. They just have different names. But these people were blessed by God, but yet they would forget about what God had done for them. So if you are hungry and ready to be fed this morning spiritually, say amen. amen. All right. We have not because we ask not, but that's not the case this morning because God's going to feed his people and give us what we need for today and for tomorrow. Amen. You know God's a good God if he can go ahead and cover and take care of your Monday. Amen, somebody? Amen. Amen. All right, so here we go. Let's dig in this morning. Um, we're going to read the first few verses here of Exodus 17, and I'm going to make reference to what just concluded in Exodus 16. May God richly bless and add to the reading of his word this morning. Verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin. After their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide or murmur with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide or murmur or fuss against me? He says, Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? Verse 3, And the people thirsted there for water. 
And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up of Egypt to kill us, our children, and our cattle with thirst? Now that sounds a little familiar because we've just been talking about how they were, you brought us out so that we would die of hunger. So now they're talking about dying of thirst. Verse 4, And people, Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto these people? They be almost ready to stone me. Aren't you glad that you're not God sometimes? Because we wouldn't be as merciful as God is. Amen. Boy, we put them in a spiritual headlock. It don't matter if they was tapping out and say, keep tapping. It only be they quit tapping. Well, then we'd let them out. Amen, somebody. Amen. May God cast those thoughts far from your mind this morning. Amen. <laughs> Look at verse 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people. That means go ahead of them and, and take with thee the elders of Israel. Notice he, he wants to carry a certain group with him. And thy rod, don't forget the rod. He says, and wherewith thou smotest the river, he says, take it in thy hand and go. So this rod is the, the rod that God gave to Moses. And it's the same rod that he held over the Red Sea. All right, and it parted, so they, they, people are familiar with this rod. And it says, verse 6, he says, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock. That's so key. In Oreb, he says, And thou shalt smite the rock, which means I want you to hit that rock one time, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. In verse 7, last verse, he says, And he called the name of the place Massa, and he says Meribah, because of the chiding or the murmuring or strife of the children of Israel. And because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So notice We'll talk more about that in a minute, but he names the place where these people are because of their conduct. In chapter 16, there are, now I want you to try to, this is, this is pretty, pretty approximate, so this is not just guesswork. But when you start looking at the Omer and the Ephah and you look at the different measuring that they had in the scriptures there, when you read chapter 16 or have, you notice there's a measurement there and a portion of bread that rained down from heaven for the people because they was hungry. Remember, they were saying the same things. You brought us here to die when we could be back eating some Brunswick stew in Egypt. We just, we wish that God would let us go back to where we come from and let us die in, in the slavery and the bondage of Egypt. At least we'd be able to eat good. Well, God says that's not the point. He says, in here, now the people are getting thirsty. Now, you would think when God has done something great for somebody that we would be appreciative. But God knows that we will forget what he has done for us. Now, you may not forget mentally, but you will forget spiritually. Now, we all know that God saved us this morning. But if I was to ask you this morning, are you saved? And you can tell me you saved and there's not a sparkle in your eye, a little bit of joy in your heart, a little smile on your face. You just look there, and, and I could have basically just told you that we just run out of food. And you give me the same expression as you would that you've been saved. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. That, that, that should be a countenance. That should be an appreciation. You know, it would be one thing. Let's, let's get a little bit closer. If I told you your child was sick, you give me a look, and I tell you that your child's been healed, you give me the same look, then does, does it mean the same to you? Is there, is there no difference between that? If I tell you that you got bills to pay and the look on your face is the same, that all your bills have been paid, you have no debt, you'd probably look different. Amen? You, you wouldn't be warming up leftovers today. Amen, somebody? And man, we're going to be eating high on the hog. And so what happens is, if I tell you this morning 
that you've got a sin debt and hell is sure to be your home and the look on your face is the same when I tell you your debt's been paid and that heaven is your home, something's wrong. Something's wrong. And we got to figure out what's wrong. So like they said when that plane was going down, they said something wrong. Let me tell you, something wrong. We got to figure out what's wrong with you, all right, and what's wrong with me. And so, God help us this morning, watch, every single morning, if you would take a freight train and put 45 cars that would hold 15 tons, which is 30,000 pounds, if you took a freight train with 45 cars, and every car had 15 tons of bread. That's exactly what God provided every single day to the desert. Every day. Now, we know that on the Sabbath, which was Saturday in the Old Testament, he brought twice as much on Friday. Because he brought enough for Saturday on Friday. So when I say every day, it's just a, an equal amount. In fact, on Friday, you'd have to take a freight train with 90 cars at 15 ton of bread, 30,000 pounds per car. That's what God brought from heaven down to these people every single morning on an average. Can you imagine? God raining down so much bread. That's a lot of bread when you begin to think about 675 tons, 1,000 tons that he laid down there. It was estimated that there was over a million pounds of bread that he put out every morning. Now, guys, I'm going to tell you right now, I like bread. And you know what God said? And bread like me too. Amen. Bread hangs around me a lot more than I hang around it. Amen, somebody. All right. You think somebody doesn't run your bridges too high a heat. Amen. Or you'll think you done got your youngest bridges on. No, them's yours. And when you got to lay back on your bed and, and take a deep, deep breath to get it buttoned, just pray to God that thing never comes loose because you're going to knock somebody's eye out. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's why we like elastic the older we get. Ain't nobody could have made you wear elastic when you were little. But when you get older, you say, elastic, my friend. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you love elastic. It's in your fave five there, dear, sir. And so what happens is you, you, you realize that God brained a lot of bread. Now, you would think if, if God rained that much bread down and, and in the evening he brought quail. So what did God say? He says, we not gonna, you will not eat by just bread alone. So he, he brings them bread. And he did this for 40 years. 40 years. <clears throat> now, don't get me wrong. I think I would get tired of eating bread and quail. Amen? Isn't that what the guy said about his dog eating collards? You don't think a dog eat collards, you let him go seven days without anything else to eat. He'll eat them collards. And by the way, you don't think your child will eat nothing else other than chicken nugget and fries. You let him go about a week and see what happens. Amen. Amen, somebody? Amen. Amen. I hate it, but they'll eat it. Amen. <laughs> they'll eat the wrapper off of the collard can if you let them go long enough. Amen, somebody? All right. Now... Now that y'all know that, we can go home. Just kidding. What, what, what happens now is God said, okay, I just, I'm doing this. So here's what I'm saying. God's blessing them with food every day. And, and, and what God is saying is, you on the move. If you notice, they've already traveled, all right, from, from Mara, and they've traveled to Elam, and, and now they're traveling. And, 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 and God's saying that it is not the place that I bless. It's the people. Very important. 
What he's saying is no matter where you go, I'm going to bless you. He said, and watch this. Even at the conclusion in verse 7, he names the place of Massa there in Meribah. He names them that, and he explains why in verse 7. He says, I'm going to name the place you in all because you have murmured and griped and bellyate. Now, I want to show you something. God's saying, even though the town that you live in or the street where you stay is named because of your conduct, then he says, but even though it's got a bad name, I'm here to tell you, even though it's got a name that describes your attitude, he said, I'm still going to bless you even when you're in a bad place. Even when the name of the place you live in, it does not have a good name. God's saying, I don't bless the place. I bless the people. Listen, church, I love this place. God don't bless this place. God blesses these people. When you start looking around, sometimes we have to understand and let our eyes be open that if there is a place being blessed, it's only because there are people there that he wants to bless. The, the, the result of a place being blessed is a result of the overflow of the people being blessed. Don't ever look around in your environment and say, well, God has blessed this place. Oh, no. God ain't blessed this place. God blessed the people. And, and if there's an overflow or an abundance, this place is blessed only because God has blessed the people. And sometimes I think we get that backwards. We say, he's blessed this place. I mean, haven't you heard that so many times? God's blessed this place. God's blessed it. No, no, no. God's blessed these people. Even though we haven't always carried the right title. But now let me ask you this morning. If God had the name where you are living right now, what would be name of your place? Huh? Would it be called Hard Head Avenue? Huh? Would it be called Negative Boulevard? Would it be called Belly Eight Street? What would he name the place you live? Church, that right there will hit home right there now. Don't be thinking about your neighbor. You already know your neighbor's worse than you are. Now leave them alone. <laughs> Amen? Let's just go ahead and resolve that and be done with that. Your neighbor's far worse than you are, and you feel pretty good about it right now because you know how bad as they are. Now that you got that fixed, let's talk about you. Amen? Because compared to Jesus, we got some issues. We got some problems. We, some, we, make some, we, we messed up sometimes. And what God is saying is, what would he name? Would it be called Doubtville? Would it be called Fearville? Would it be called, would it be called I don't knowville? You ever heard of people, sometimes they complain, and you say, well, what's the answer? I don't know. I wish somebody kill I don't know. <laughs> Amen? You know what I always say? Don't bring me no problem unless you've got a solution. Amen? Don't come venting your belly aching to me. What I'm saying is, God's saying is, what would be the name of the place you are? Or, or let's, let's get positive now. Would God call this perseverance? Would he, would he call this strongville? Would this be called courageousville? Would this be called resilientville? See, the thing I've loved, and I've used this as an illustration before, if you, we will learn to be like a basketball, it'll do us well. See, the thing is, we're going to get knocked down. Church, can you relate with me this morning? You ever, you ever get knocked down? You ever feel like the feet got sweeped out from up under you? You feel like you've ever been blindsided at the intersection of life? There's some times that we are going to get hit, and it's going to hit us so hard it knocks us down. There isn't anything vulnerable about talking about that this morning. We've got to be real here. But what God is saying is he says, 
you are like uh, my basketball. He says, the harder you get slammed down, the higher you bounce back up. You ever notice that? You just do a little dribble, she'll come up about. But if you slam that ball down, it'll get up higher than your head. So what God is saying is we need to be resilient this morning. Say, hey, we might be hit. We might be knocked down. We might be a little off track. We might be, you know, looking in some places we shouldn't be looking and doing some things we shouldn't be doing. And we may be hit. We may be victim of circumstance. But God is saying this morning to all his people, be resilient this morning. And listen, just know that the harder you get knocked down, the higher you can bounce back up. And then when you get up there, you can see more than you've ever seen before. You can experience things you've never experienced before. And God is saying sometimes you've got to do without before you'll know what is within. And so he tells his people here, he says, listen, I'm having to purge you. Think about it. He says, you would think for a minute, God loves these people and he freed these people. Why won't he, why won't he give them something to drink? Why won't he give them some food? What he's saying is, he says, you've eaten that stuff so long and you've drank that stuff so long. He says, we got to purge you. I've got to break those habits you've got. Have you ever noticed that even when you got saved, even when you got saved, Sometimes something might still slip out your mouth. Amen? Amen? And then you wonder, then there's people who are so shallow in the faith, they, well, they must not have got it. Let me tell you something. Guys, there are habits in our life, not, not just addictions. There's habits in our life. We are creatures of habit. I'm not making an excuse or giving you a license to sin, but what I'm saying is you do something so long, it becomes habitual. It, it's something that ha it happens, and then you'll get to wondering, well, wonder if I even got saved because this is still happening. There, there are tendencies that we have, and God is saying that these people here, they have a tendency, they're, they're still griping and complaining. You know why? Because in Egypt, they got everything they needed as long as they were obedient to their taskmasters. They got water, and they got, but they were, they were feeding them and watering them for the wrong reason. They were feeding them and, and, and watering them so they would be a slave to sin. And God is taking these people and saying, I'm not giving you food. I'm not giving you water like your old life. He said, I don't want you to be like you used to be. I want you to be transformed. I want you to be changed. I want you to be new. I want you to have new thoughts and new ideas, a new way about you. I want people to be able to see the love of God in your life. I want people to see the change in your life, to see the evidence. And that's what happens when, when we touch the hem of the garment of Christ, when we come in contact with God's only Son, the Lamb of God. When we, when we come in contact, we spend time with Him, it'll change your life, and, and the evidence there will be seen. And many times you can tell when people spend time with the Lord and when they don't. I'm here to tell you today there's no way possible that any man, woman, boy, or girl of any color, of any background, these things are regardless what God is saying is, if you will spend time with Jesus, I promise you, it will change your life. You cannot leave the room and be the same. You can walk in down and gloomy and God have done all these things for you. But I'm telling you, that song has it so well. Just a little talk with Jesus will make a difference in your life. And sometimes that's the problem. We, we're out living this life and we don't have Christ and and he realized, listen, guys, when you think about the, <laughs> watch, ready? Jesus was the bread. I'm not going to go there this morning and read it, but you can write this down. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 talk about the bread, and it talks about the rock, and it talks about the meat, and it says all of those things were Christ. All those things are Christ. So we don't have to sit here this morning and say, well, we're just drawing a conclusion that this rock is Christ. No. Paul talks to the church of Corinth and tells them that when Moses was in the wilderness, this was the form or type of Christ. So what was happening is everything revolves around Jesus Christ. And guys, if this whole word is built around Jesus Christ, if our lives are not built around it, then who are we? We cannot expect success having practices of failure. We're only going to be successful if we practice and put principles in of success, we have to look to someone who's greater than us, somebody that's more powerful than us. 
It can't be based on yesterday or just today, but it has to be the one. Listen, what they said, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know the one who holds tomorrow. Yes, we do. And so what happens is we begin to know this morning that, watch this, let me tell you, every day there was a locomotive with 45 train cars full of Jesus coming into the desert every day. That's a lot of Jesus. Hey, and then they got there, and they got thirsty, and they said, I need something to drink. God said, good. I needed you to get depleted from the waters of Egypt, from the waters there that came, that the waters of sin. He said, I needed you to dry up. Sometimes we need to dry up in some of these areas in our life. We need our mouth to be dried up. We need our minds to be dried up. We need our hearts to be dried up so God can fill us up. He says, we need this morning. Sometimes, listen, you, you think that God has forsaken you. You don't know what's going on. You, you, you would think that you, you, the first thing we do, and I'm grateful and thankful, but you, you begin to think something's wrong. Listen, everything can be right. It doesn't mean that Jesus has turned his... And listen, let me tell you, let me set the record straight. Jesus don't punish none of his people. Listen, you sit around, I, well, I reckon the Lord's He ain't punishing you. Let me tell you something. Hey, if he said he will forgive you of your sin, if he'll wash you white as snow, if that blood has the power that we even begin to think it has, he says, I will cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. You start talking about your sin, he says, what are you even talking about? I don't even remember that anymore. He says, you remember, but I don't remember. He said, when I died on that cross, I paid for your sin once and for all. He said, I've cleansed you. I don't care what the devil tells you. I don't care what your friends say. I don't care what you tell yourself. Even if you hadn't forgiven yourself, I have forgiven you. And he says this morning that all these things that have happened, we have been washed. We have been cleansed. And God is telling us this morning that what he supplies for us will meet our every need. So it's good to get dried up sometimes so we can appreciate what God has supplied for us. I need an oxygen tank. And somebody who knows how to wave one of them things without their wrist getting tired. Amen. Hallelujah. I, like I said, if I pass out, I better not see a man standing over me. Amen, somebody. I'm just saying now. I'm going to tell you now. I'm going to come up out that cot. All right. Here we go. Johnny. Better not be no, no John. <laughs> All right, here we go. Y'all ready for a little bit more? Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Oh, here we go. All right. God tells his people here, he says, I love this part. Let's, let's look back at Exodus 17. Let's look at the, the verse there, verse, uh, verse 5. The Lord said unto Moses, he said, go on before the people. Now, I'm going to show you something here for a minute now because this is, this is the staple I want to leave you with. Everybody in this house, everybody, everybody listening, everybody viewing, everybody you'll come in contact with, everybody needs a rock in their life. You need something solid. You need something that you can lean back on. Let me tell you something about these more mortal bodies we're very feeble at times we need something that's stronger than us we need something that when we get into sinking sand that we can find a lifeline something we can hold on to because church I'm going to tell you this life is not always easy but it's always worth it no question but we need something this morning that will anchor us something that will stable us sometimes and especially of late, there's too much of this. There's too much wavering. There's too much up and down, back and forth. For God's sakes, we've got to make our mind up and do what we're going to do. And we have to understand that wherever you are in life, and this morning, whether I know you or not, I'm going to tell you something. Hey, I'll promise you with all that I am, and I gain nothing by making this statement. There is not a person in here that I do not love. 
And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. You say, well, preacher, you don't even know me. That might be why I love you so much. <laughs> I get to knowing you, it might change. I might go from love to like. Amen, somebody. But when I'm serious, I'm telling you this morning, I promise you, I wish every one of you well. I want the very best for you and your life. I, I, I want you to have the full, listen to this word now, the full benefit of Christ in your life. Guys, I'm telling you, there ain't no need in we, God's people, living on scraps, just, just getting a little bit left. No, 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 God says pull up to the table, just like he told these people. He said, I'm about to bring a locomotive with 45 cars full of bread. He said, every day. He says, when I come through there and, 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 and pull the old Jesus, choo, choo, and they come into the, listen, listen. He said, I can bring bread to your desert too. He said, I can bring water to your desert too. See, what was good is, ready, you have not. That's right. God said, I want you to learn how to lean on me. L let me say something to my independent women. May, may I address you real quick? I love you. Jesus loves you. And your man has no choice but to love you. Preacher done went from preaching to meddling. Amen, somebody. It's okay and it's good for you to be independent. I admire you for your strength. But I'm going to tell you, if you're just a fully independent woman, God needs to change your heart and your mind this morning. You need to learn how to be independent, but you need to learn how to be interdependent. And there again, I admire your strength. And listen, let me just tell you this morning, I love women a lot more than I love men. So I'm on your side. All right? So understand that. But I'm here to tell you this morning, if you're just a fully independent woman and you have no interdependence, that is not God's design for your life. You say, preacher, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've been through. I had to get tough or die. I admire that. I believe I promise you your strength is beautiful. But I want you to understand, you may have had to have been one way, but that don't mean you have to die that way. Because you've got a Father in heaven that has never left you nor forsaken you. And I want you to know today, it's good to be independent, but it's good to be interdependent as well. Let's don't lose sight of that. And what God is saying to these people is, he says, I need you to be an independent, I need you to be strong. He says, I want you to be courageous. Same concept, ready? He says, I want you to be strong and independent. He says, but I need you to be interdependent upon me. See, God desires. You know why he only sent bread once a day? Barring, barring Friday now. Remember, he didn't want to do that on the Sabbath because of the holy day. But you know why he sent bread. And you know what happened? When they took the bread up, what they didn't eat, it spoiled and, and waxed away. You know why he did that? Because God said, I want you to get a dose of heaven's bread. A fresh dose every day. You know what he was saying? He said, I want you to get a dose of Jesus every single day. He says, you can't say what I got on Sunday. See, that's the thing. What you got on Sunday, Sunday's bread, is not going to just carry you on Monday. But I'm going to tell you what, they, he'll bring another locomotive to wherever you are come Monday morning, early. And he'll bring you enough bread for the day. You see, what I love about this rock was, hey, listen, an estimated 3 million people, 3 million Israelites, counting women and children and everyone, in the desert. Can I submit to you that there was only one rock? See, it would go against the word of God if he says there were boulders of rock. One rock. You imagine drinking 45 locomotives worth of bread you're going to drink a, a lot of water. Amen? And you can imagine one rock supplied all the water for three million people to drink every single day. 
That's a lot of water in that rock. See, this wasn't just a stream. This was a river of life. And so what happened, though, was it says that God led Moses. And he says, get the people, get the elders to follow you. He, he, said, he said, get these other pastors to come together. And I will tell you this morning, church, it would be a very good lesson to learn that passage. It'd be a very, very, very important lesson for you to realize that God calls these men to lead congregations. But congregations don't like that. And then congregations don't realize that when they murmur against the men of God, they're actually murmuring against God. So just remember, when you murmur, envision God's face as closely as possible. And when you, get, when you put your finger back down in your pocket from pointing fingers and raising your voice, just remember you just spoke to the one who created you and breathed breath into your body. It would do you well and serve you well to learn that. I don't want this position. I'll trade it with anybody at any time, I promise you. You can have my job and I'll certainly take yours. Don't mind it a bit. In fact, I dare to say that my load would be lighter. My responsibility would not be as great. And I wouldn't have near the attention. And I'm good with that. But until you're ready to do that job, until you're ready to be called that job, it would do you well to learn that passage. It would do me well to learn that passage. We need to learn that passage. Because if you notice, God said, I'll be right ahead of you, Moses. He said, but don't bring the whole congregation. He said, just bring the other elders. He said, because I need y'all to see. And I love this, ready? He says, you, you lead out in front of the people. He says, but guess what? Notice what he said in that verse. Verse 6, he says, he said, but I'll be standing on the rock. See, God will lead his people to the rock. And I'm telling you today, I'll promise you with all that I am, hear me this morning. There are some people right here today that are sinking a little bit every day. And you are going to continue to sink in whatever it is. And that thing has a lot of names, places, persons, titles. You better believe it. And God is saying this morning, I'm going to extend my long arm of grace to you. And he said, I want to put you on the rock. But notice this, you can't be looking back. God said, I'll be ahead of you. He said, I can lead you from where you are to where you need to be. I always love how God, doesn't, God doesn't never say turn around and look back. He says, always look ahead. Guys, I'm telling you, there's nothing in the past that will ever help you in the present. God is saying that I'm going to be ahead of you. Now, ready? Watch this. When Moses gets there, and this is how we're going to close, Miss Tabby. <clears throat> Christ gets there. Christ gets there, and he's out in there, and, and the people don't know Christ. They just know that one day there's a Messiah coming, you know? And I'll tell you, this is so good right here. I get so stinking giddy about this right here. He says, God's out there, and there's a lot of people. And, and I know, I know that. Listen, God's almighty. But you got to remember, God hates sin. I mean, what does he say in Revelation? Jesus says, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He said, I, I hate it. And I thought to myself, I said, how can love hate? Strong. And it's not that there's a contradiction in the Word of God, because there's not. But what he's saying is, God hates anything that doesn't look like Him. When it's had a, change, a chance to change. God hates the 
unwillingness of people to change in free will. Because there's not a person in this place that cannot change. There's not a person in this place that cannot be saved. Everybody here can be saved. Everybody in here. I'm not saying you can be happy. Because there's a difference between happiness and joy. But I'm going to tell you, joy will make you stand when you don't have no strength to stand. Joy will help you be able to say it as well. Even when you're walking there in the procession with with the body there of one that you've loved more than life itself. And God says, let me tell you something. He says, in your wilderness, in your desert, He said, I have begun a work in you that I will finish. And He says, out here where it's dry and you're thirsty, He says, good, I've got you right where I want you. And God is saying, listen, I wanted you to see what you look like on the inside. See, God already knows what you look like. God don't need to test you in order to find out what you're made up of. God has to test you in order so you'll know what you're made up of. And so he said, I had to get these people out here. And he said, I had to put them through such a time so that they would be able to see that they have a desperate unbelief inside of them. And I'm going to say to you today, if you are in this place and you believe that God is real, not just God, but Jehovah by distinction, Yahweh. And if you believe that His Son is Jesus Christ, and you believe that He is the one who came and died for us, if you believe that He has paid the penalty for your sin and for everyone's sin, and that he rose on the third day from that grave when God called his name, then there's no reason for us to be defeated, for us to be down and out and be depressed. Because heaven is our home, and Jesus is our king. And we need to realize today that we are a liberated free people. And I get sick and tired of my people living defeated. Sick and tired of my people living like they're lost in their sin. Listen, I'm going to tell you it would do us well to live like we're saved. It would be good to know that. But watch what happens. When he gets out there, he says, Moses, he says, you have not because you ask not. Now, just notice this morning. You leave here this morning and you don't ask for the rock. You won't have the rock. Just know that. But guess what? The rock was already in the desert all along. He says Jesus was always there. He says, it didn't matter where you went or what you did. He said, Jesus was there, and he's always within walking distance. He was there all along. He's always been there. People say when they start living for the Lord, they say, man, Jesus is talking to me like never before. No, 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 you're just listening like you've never listened before. He's been talking to you for a long time. He even says, for God's sake, it's about time. And you know, watch this. This is so good. Ready? Moses. Now, this will get, there's, there's a story about this with Moses in a minute. And, and it's weird about Moses. Moses dies at the age of 120. He lived in three different places in three different 40-year intervals. He lived in Egypt with Pharaoh there for 40 years. He then was in Midian there on the desert farming with Uncle Jethro there for 40 years. And then he spends the last 40 years of his life in the desert with a bunch of disobedient, murmuring people. Sometimes I get a little overwhelmed of having 900 members of people doing a little bit of complaining. I could only imagine 3 million. (laughs) Moses was the man. And he did it for 40 years? I need a rock right now. He said, he says, Moses, he says, I'll be standing ahead of you. Listen to me, church. We're done, I promise. He said, and you'll know which rock. He said, because I'll be standing on it. 
He said, now Moses, when you get to the rock, he said, I want you to take that rod in your hand. The same one that you held over the waters of the Red Sea and it parted. He said, yes, sir, I got it, boss. He says, now take that rod that I give you. He said, I want you to hit that rock. He said, I want you to smack it. I want you to hit it with everything you've got. You look up the word smitten. He didn't tap it. He said, I want you to swing that rod like you've never swung it before. He said, hit that rod. And the minute he hit it, water began to release. He said, now tell my people to drink. Now watch. This was the prelude to when God said, I have water of life. For every human being, he said, I'm going to make an atonement once and for all. See, what we fail to see is that when he says, hit that rock with everything you've got, and it will pour out the water. See, watch. When Jesus was hit by his own father and nailed to that tree, it then released the Holy Spirit of God that represents the water that is free to all people. He says, but until that rock got hit, he said, until there was a Christ and a cross and faith and a moving of the Holy Spirit, which constitutes our Christianity, he said, only until then, could people get what they needed in the wilderness, in the desert of life? Let me tell you something. I pray to God this morning that he names this place this morning redemption. That he says, because of my people's conduct, because of my people's attitude, because of my people's behavior, he says, Perhaps this morning that we're going to leave this place this morning and God would give it a new name. That God would name it this morning the redemptive and the revived. And that we would be able to burst from this place this morning. Hey, listen, be excited about what God has done and know this morning that no matter where you are, God said, I'll feed you. I'll water you. I'll give you everything you need. But I have to understand this morning that everybody needs to find that rock. That we need to let the people that God's put in our life lead us to where they need to be. Can I tell you, the people, the congregation of Israel would have never found a rock had they not listened to God's man, to God's woman. There are people that God has put in your life. Listen to me now. Let's, let, let's, let's get this straight and more close. A lot of times people say, yeah, that, that, that person's been my rock. No, they haven't. That. Man, that, that place, man, that's just been a rock. No, what happened? No, what happened? Well, well, my friend, man, my friend, I can just that, no, they had you wrong. Now, your friend will lead you to the rock. The rock is your rock. Nobody, no place, but God gives people in your life that's not your rock, but they can lead you to the rock, and they can get your feet back on solid ground. Stand with me this morning. Now, church, listen to me. We've had some good services in here. And I believe this morning that Jesus is in this place. Now, now I'm going to tell you something. Ready? You listen to me good this morning because I love you because I've been right where you've been. With the power that is invested in me by the Holy Spirit of God, this is the most important message that we have preached this year. And I'm going to tell you what I see between me and you. This, this area between you and I. There is a resistance this morning, and I can feel the 
presence of Almighty God. But I can see and feel the presence of Satan in this room. And right now, he's trying to stop you from giving way to the Word of God this morning. I can feel something between you and I. And I need my, my Christians to be praying right now. I can feel it. And what God is saying this morning is, see, Satan's trying to stop you because you're sinking. I'm going to tell you right now, there ain't no telling where you're going to be in three months if you let this pass you by. I dare to say it won't be here, and if it is, your head won't be, your heart won't be. I'm telling you, church, I don't know a lot, but I can tell you, I feel something this morning that the light of Christ needs to burst forth and break through. And I'm going to tell you right now, unless you push, unless you press in the next few moments, it's going to consume you. I just believe this needs to, how, how this ends has a lot to do with what will begin. But sometimes some things have to come to an end before other things can begin. There's got to be a funeral sometime before there can be new life. And church, I'm pleading with you this morning. Let the Spirit of God move this morning because there's a quenching of the Spirit in this place. But we know one that can lift the quench. See, the, the difference is there's somebody in here this morning that is the key. And it's not me. There's somebody in this audience right now that is the key to breaking through. Somebody in here will move. And when you move, this place is going to break loose. And this morning, if there was ever a doubt in your mind, you need to remove it. If you, listen to these words again. Do you believe in God Almighty? Do you believe that it is His Son that frees us? Do you believe this morning that we all can get on a slippery slope? Do you believe that sometimes our ground is not so solid? God is saying this morning, follow me, I'm going to carry you to the rock. Hey, we need the Spirit of God to break loose in here. We need, the, we need God to move this morning. And then listen this morning, listen. Don't quench His Spirit. Don't you tell Him no. Don't you tell Him tomorrow. But you tell Him, yes, Lord. Hey, He's been good to us. Hey, He said you may, you may be in a place, but remember, I don't, I don't bless the place. I bless the people. He said my son didn't die for a location. He said, but my son died for the people. So God don't bless the place, God blesses the people. And if the place is blessed, it's blessed because the people are blessed because there's an overabundance. And I'm here to tell you this morning, we need to tell the devil no and tell Jesus yes. And we need to raise up, rise up this morning and put our feet on the rock because God's standing on it. And he says, follow me this morning. He said, and I'll bless you. I'll prosper you. I'll get you where you need to be. I'll make you feel like you need to feel. And God said, it's time to stand on the rock. So this morning, this is God's house, not my house. This is God's house. Would you do me a favor this morning? If God is speaking to you, respond. Don't be concerned about what these other people think or what they say. I, I know we need to go, but believe it or not, I'm 10 minutes earlier than I normally am, so you got 10 good minutes. It may be the best 10 minutes you'll spend all day. God has called you. He's challenged you. Now it's your turn. Let's sing. These altars are open.